we welcome you once again to the latest and greatest edition of Six Rings and Football Things, brought to you by WEI Odyssey and 2400 Sports. You know where it's at at the end of the week. We like to go behind enemy lines and give you, the Foxborough faithful and the most diehard of Pats pals, a peek behind those enemy lines and see what they're saying about your favorite football team and how things may shake out on Sunday. But today, we have an extra special behind enemy lines because we're going to go behind all the enemy lines of the AFC East here on Six Rings and Football Things with our pal from Fox Sports. He is the AFC East beat reporter extraordinaire, the one and the only Mr. Henry McKenna. What's good, my guy? Yo, how are we doing today, guys? Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're very excited, and uh, we we got a huge game on Sunday, a game a few weeks ago that we thought was just going to be perhaps a, a humid and meaningless slog or a runaway, a beatdown. And uh, after last Sunday now, the tables, they have turned, to say the least. And there's a lot more juice in the area. But before we even get into Pats and Finns on Sunday, um, last night the Buffalo Bills play a Thursday night football game. Of course, you cover the whole AFC East for Fox Sports. And – after that result, how how do we do we need to reframe the Patriots' victory over Buffalo, given the fact that we see Buffalo once again kind of, I don't know, do Buffalo things like look good but struggle at the same time? Yeah, that's I mean, that's how I'd categorize this Buffalo team. They are a sort of on paper excellent on field disappointing product right now. And and you know, Patriots fans saw it last week sort of in a perfect example of how they could cost themselves the game. Uh, but Buffalo has yet to figure out really how to take the next step as an organization. It has to do, I think, with the coaching staff, not yet figuring out exactly how they are going to identify, the, you know, the team. And, the, and then it comes to Josh Allen. La last night we saw him take, I would actually say, a sort of regression step. And I say that because – he needed and and the offensive coordinator Ken Dorsey used Josh Allen's rushing game to open up the offense. Um, it was uh, it was early in the game and Josh Allen is rushing for first downs. He rushed for a touchdown. And then all of a sudden, when Josh Allen started scrambling, the defense started to bite. And you saw, you know, for example, on Dalton Kincaid's touchdown, Levante David is sort of trying to attack the line of scrimmage instead of sitting back and waiting for the pass to happen. He's saying, okay, you know, let's go tackle J Josh Allen. Uh, and that opens up uh, some gaps in the defense. You know, Josh Allen finds an easy Dalton Kincaid uh, completion. He gets yards after the catch. It's a touchdown. So that's kind of the Buffalo D offense that we saw last year. That was really good. And um, the problem is, you know, Cam Newton was drafted two years after Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford is still in the NFL. Cam Newton, we all know, has retired. Uh, and so you get a guy like Josh Allen, who his comps were for sort of Cam Newton. And I think now the Bills organizationally need to shift it toward Matthew Stafford or Patrick Mahomes, somebody who's, who's protected. Uh, and they don't want to shorten. Like they're thinking in terms of winning in their window now, Right. But he's a quarterback that could win for 10 years if they take care of him. And and so they're kind of I'm a little worried for his career if they, if they think that running the ball is the answer to, to all their offensive woes. Yeah, I think that's been the story the last couple of years. It's like, well, we need to run the ball with a running back and we need to not lean on Josh to do everything. And then it's like, oh, but we're kind of struggling. Let's lean on Josh again. And I understand it because you do need to win regular season games too. You can't just say, oh, we'll let him do what he needs to do come January. Um, but I do find this whole, this window right here between Sunday and Sunday for the Patriots, seeing the Bills, getting a win over the Bills that nobody thought was coming. You're a ho home dog by eight and a half points. And the Bills at one point when they beat the Dolphins were the best team in football. Now they're kind of facing their critics. And the Dolphins, who you head to, people are like, well, do they only beat bad teams when they face the Eagles and the Bills? They come up short, and then the Patriots are in the middle as, well, you were the worst team in football in some power rankings as recently as like two weeks ago, but now it's like, wait a minute, if, if you beat the Dolphins in Miami, are you actually pretty good and do it? Like, this whole window here is like, to me, the perfect example of why the NFL is awesome, because we have no idea what the F we're watching from week to week. Even us 
experts, and I will put it in air quotes for myself. You guys can stay as regular experts. I'm an expert. Um, so how do you think this sort of hierarchy of the AFC East measure? Like, for, who do you believe is the best team in the AFC East? That's a really good question that is so hard to answer. But I think the yeah. Dolphins are. Um, I think the Dolphins are. The The reason is is simple. I think not only are they the most talented team, but they are are probably – right now the best coach team as well so uh even if they have the you know occasional slip up and a a head-to-head loss against buffalo which was in buffalo and i think that's that's sort of a big thing i mean um this division and and really all divisions in football are, are it's like so chaotic they know each other so well they start to really understand how to beat each other there creates sort of like a greater uh possibility for upsets within divisions. Um, and I do think there are little brother, big brother relationships that develop that create these sort of like psychological barriers. Like we've seen for years between the Patriots and the Jets where the Patriots just beat up on, on the Jets. And um, so I, I think that sort of like creates false equivalencies that aren't there, you know, as for who's better than whom. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'll take the Dolphins. I really think that, I mean, you just, that, that team is ridiculous. Even, even with those big losses to the Eagles and and the Bills, I I like them better, but I don't know. What do you guys think? I would probably say I, 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 you'd think it should be Buffalo, but if the Jets were at full strength, there was a chance, excuse me, if Aaron Rodgers were still playing, it may have been the Jets. It's not the Patriots right now, obviously. (laughs) It might very well be Miami, but We've actually dubbed the game on Sunday, Andy, uh, excuse me, rather, Henry. We're calling it the fraud bowl because one of these two teams is going to, and like, there's a very likely outcome that one of these two teams is going to prove themselves to be fraudulent. Now, it could just be a really good game and one team could win by anywhere between one to six points. And we'll say, okay, the Patriots are better than advertised uh, or the Dolphins are not a juggernaut, but they're still a very good team. But if, if Miami kicks the crap out of the Patriots and they return to who they were when they were one and five, then they're kind of fraudulent and they aren't who we thought they were coming off of last Sunday. And that was maybe more about Buffalo and the Pats just looked good on one given Sunday. But if Miami mails in another performance like they did against Buffalo and, you know, against Philadelphia, then maybe they're kind of a front runner as well. So there's a good chance we'll get a quick look, uh, a solid look at, both teams, and this is pivotal for especially the Patriots because if they get the crap kicked out of them or they lose Sunday, we could be looking at a team that's going to have to disband a lot of its pieces and could be very active in the trade market. We heard reports yesterday, uh, other personnel directors around the league don't know which way the Pats are going to go because if they win, they may want to acquire talent, but if they lose, they may ship a couple guys off. Yeah, I think they're going to, I think they're going to stand pat. Remember, um, the first year after Brady, when at the trade deadline they were two, they were two and six or something like that, and and they they traded for Isaiah Ford, right? And then you know I guess it was, <laughs> right? right they they like acquired, uh, and then you look at obviously the Super Bowl year where they they traded away Jamie Collins, one of their key defensive pieces, and it's not just the history. Like obviously I'm hearing a few things about you know and and the, the Pats might feed that information to try and gain trade leverage, but I am hearing they're not super interested in getting rid of pieces. Um, they're instead doing what they always do, which is bargain shop. Um, <laughs> woefully committed to, to shopping at the goodwill of the NFL. Um, but uh, as for the actual matchup this week, yeah, you know, I, I get to do something fun, which is tell you that the Pats are going to lose by like 10 points. Um I know you guys are feeling like uh, maybe the <laughs> maybe there's there's a chance in this game. I, I know. Sorry, Fitzy. Um, this Dolphins team is is really good. Uh, they are at home, where you know they're kind of the Patriots' daddies. Uh, they have Tua, who's never lost to Bill Belichick. The the sort of like Jedi mind tricks that he can pull on a lot of like Zach Wilson types. They just don't work on Tua, um, and. Finally, the Dolphins secondary. And now we don't know what's actually happening with Jalen Ramsey. He There was like a back and forth between him and Adam Schefter last night. Schefter said, oh, Jalen Ramsey is going to be back. 
Jalen Ramsey was like, I didn't know that. Uh, so <laughs> I think, it, you know, Schefter's information is rarely bad. So he, he's probably hearing something, um, you know, from he's probably got good information. It's just that, that, that they haven't communicated it to Ramsey yet. But, you know, if Ramsey is back, then you have Jalen Ramsey, Xavier Howard and slot corner Nick Needham. But, you know, he, Nick Needham is kind of like the John Jones. He's maybe not that caliber, but he's kind of the name that that Miami holds so dearly to them, just like John Jones would be held dearly to New England, but it's not like a national name. So you put your – and by the way, if Ramsey's back and Needham's back, it would be their first games back. Xavier Howard missed a game last week. So it's kind of like this, this sort of moment of finally for their secondary. And their secondary has looked like trash. It is the Achilles heel of this defense and of the team as a whole. So if they get all of a sudden, they go from sort of zero to hero at every single cornerback position. Um, that's a totally different defense for Vic Fangio to work with from a personnel standpoint. That could be a really scary team to go against. And that's that's kind of where I'm seeing this game going. Yeah, that could be a game changer. I mean, if you look at the injury report, they have 14 guys listed. Seven of them are defensive backs. I think six of them are cornerbacks. So obviously if those guys are out there and Ramsey is out there, and that's one reason, just quick flashback to what we were just talking about, I would put the Dolphins atop the AFC East too because unlike the Bills, they are potentially getting better. Like if you get Ramsey back over the second half of the season and he's a high-end cornerback, that's the opposite of Buffalo losing Tredavious White and Matt Milano. So I think that could factor in. But let's flip that script. Let's just say their secondary gets Ramsey and Howard's out there. We know Howard has taken the ball away from Devontae Parker a number of times in recent years in that matchup. But what do you think about the new matchup that includes Demario Douglas as a go-to guy and really Kendrick Bourne asserting himself as a number one NFL receiver the last two weeks with the production he's had? Do you believe in this new age Patriots passing attack that has kind of pushed Parker and Juju Smith Schuster down the depth chart and taken advantage of these other guys? I love it. I, I really do. Uh, you and I were joking on Twitter this this week. Uh, you know, finally, the <laughs> the media contingent is making some personnel decisions. Michael on Wenu. Yeah. yeah. Michael on Wenu, uh, you know, moves to right tackle. That's what, you know, basically every Patriots beat reporter has been calling for or speculating about uh, for years now. Uh, and then since training camp, you know, more Demario Douglas, more Kendrick Bourne. I wrote a column about why Kendrick Bourne should really be the wide receiver one this year. There, there yep. shouldn't have been much question about it. Um, but Belichick, he's so fiercely dedicated to his way of doing things, which is no mistakes. And we know that Kendrick Bourne is a guy that makes mistakes. But in this case, like you have to take the good with the bad with a guy like him, who's still the best receiver, even when he makes, you know, a, you know, a boneheaded decision, like a, a, you know, mental error that causes a penalty or a fumble. Um, we saw it last week against the bills, that fumble. Uh, and then Demario Douglas, I think it's the same thing. He's young and we see him, even when he's running into his own player, making a big play, it's like, okay, Bill, like you just gotta, you gotta give the guy a chance. You're two and five, you know, like give him some snaps, let him run in really, you know, if he, if he gets a 40 yard catch, but he hits Devonte Parker on the way. It's fine. Maybe Devonte will get injured and you can kind of put him on IR, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but less, less Juju Smith Schuster, less Devonte Parker. Stop following your wallet, Bill Belichick. You have to play the best players at this point, and they are not those two guys. So, um, but this is all stuff that Patriots fans are like, yeah, we, you know, we get it. We've been there, done that. So, <laughs> how's it? How, how is uh, Miami going to defend that? Um, you know, I think, I think um, it's it does have the opportunity to to have something similar to the like. I don't know if fans have seen the the Mac Jones's next gen passing ch chart where it shows like kind of all the dots of where Mac completed his passes. But if fans haven't, just go to Next Gen Stats, check it out. It's actually a it's very informative about like what the Patriots planned to do last week. It was just like cool let's just like let mac check it down to guys who can generate yards after the catch which is like what they should have been doing for the last two years but for whatever reason haven't been doing um and so i think that can work against this miami team um their rushers are super aggressive 
in Jalen Phillips and Bradley Chubb, just kind of like that, that Bills defensive line. So you get the ball out quick. Uh, you don't have to pass it very far into the teeth of this secondary that has really good ball hawking uh, cornerbacks in particular, if they're all healthy. Um, and maybe that can help you slow the game down a little bit because that quick passing game is actually, you know, it, we used to, when Josh McDaniels was in New England, we used to compare it to the run game. That was when there was an actual vertical passing attack and you had such luxuries as to compare what is now the whole passing game to the running game. Um, Wait, but yeah. Tyquan Thornton isn't a deep threat <laughs> on the oh, three snaps he plays. He's, he's playing especially <laughs> just now, according to. Oh, yeah, uh, he's a gunner. Great, great. Yeah. We got a vice and gunner in the second round. <laughs> he's really fast. Yeah, 165 pound gunner that's going to break apart like Ikea furniture. Uh, oh, don't hate him. Contact. Come on, he's trying. It's only a second year. Be nice. Uh, yeah, he's tiny. He's petite. He's too svelte for NFL contact. Uh, so what are the odds, you think, that we'll see the full comportment of Miami's greatest show on saltwater turf on Sunday or whatever nickname they want to give to the Mike McDaniel to a Tyreek offense? Uh, now, he said yesterday it looks like he's going to play because he was dinged up on Wednesday, had an incident practice, but then he's saying Thursday that he's going to be okay. Uh, Mostert's a little dinged up as well. Waddle's back was seizing up on him last weekend as well. Their offensive line is a bit of a mess now, just as the Patriots' offensive line has gotten itself together. And last week, Henry, we saw a compromised Patriots' defensive line generate its best pass rush of the season as well. I'd be very curious to see if they could do that again, but love to hear your thoughts on what the Dolphins are going to do given the injury issues they have out wide, up the gut, and across the line. Yeah, really good point. Uh, Isaiah Wynn went on uh, injured reserve, and while Patriots fans have – really awful memories and probably PTSD, you know, he's uh, played really well for them at guard, actually. Uh, Where which he belongs. Is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> another we one said of those. that for years, too. I yeah, was again, say. <laughs> they another, was right there in front of another you. Another W for the Patriots media contingent. What if he's a guard? Um, <laughs> too much. Um, so, yeah, the, he played well, but he's on IR. Uh, Teron Armstead, left tackle, also on IR. So, but the thing about that that's so, you know, relatable to, again, to New England um, about this Dolphins offensive line is it's been bad for years and it's like not good right now either. They have Liam Eichenberg, their formal, former absolute bust second round pick at guard. He's playing center and he's actually like playing well somehow. Uh, and it's not that he's actually playing well. It's that Tua has the fastest time to throw in the NFL. He's getting rid of the ball faster than any NFL quarterback in the league. It is not a coincidence. Mike McDaniel knows very well where the weakness of his personnel is. That's on the offensive line. Let's try and completely take them out of the game and play seven on seven. And so he has Tua in incredible timing and in incredible decision-making doing his three-step drop and finding his guy. That's the timing offense that, that this is. The sort of house of cards of that timing offense is – when that timing falls out of rhythm or when these perfect play designs kind of come undone. So um, the best example of like the play design issues were against uh, Philly. We saw Tua throw an interception deep sort of right in near the corner of the end zone. Um, and actually Tua was like, Oh, well, I just underthrew it. And McDaniel kind of blamed Tua for it after the game. He was like, Oh, well he, He's going to want that one back. But when you look at the spacing, you know, it did kind of look like the Patricia Patriots where like all the receivers ended up together in one, one place. And Darius Slay was covering Jalen Waddle. I think he cheats off and he comes down to help with Raheem Mostert because the ball is like five feet from him. It's not even that big of a cheat. And uh, he comes in and picks the ball off. Right. So the, the, what I'm trying to say basically for people who can't envision what actually just happened is Receivers are too close together and a cornerback makes has a really easy time just coming off his man and, and taking the ball away. That shouldn't happen in a good offense. And we know that Mike McDaniel, at least, you know, has been touted to be, you know, the greatest offensive mind sort of like currently in football, the, the trendiest or hottest mind. So that would be sort of like, oh, that's sort of surprising. He's not invulnerable right now. He's still making mistakes as a play designer and we're seeing it take 
take effect on the field. Um, those would be opportunities for New England secondary to flip the game and to, you know, for the first time in, in Belichick's career, get a, get a win over Tua. And then finally, you know, Mike Gesicki talked to me a little bit about this at the beginning of the year. He's a, obviously a former Dolphin, now Patriot. Um, Patriots fans, if they didn't know him before last week, they certainly do now. Um, the the uh, um, the thing about that offense is jam jam the receivers at the line of scrimmage, and that's why they run the, the most amount of motion in the entire NFL is to try and prevent uh, quarterbacks from jamming because when they can get those shifts and those motions, the players are already on the move, and you can't press them as actively. Um, because they're already moving. The, the beauty of press is it's sort of like two players at a standstill. Um, so I think that that's the, if you can get your hands on Tyreek and Jalen, then you can, what is like a perfectly timed out route, quarterback drop to route experience becomes slightly off. And then all of a sudden it sort of blows up the whole offense to a, to it is in his drop, but the receiver's not yet, you know, breaking on his route. Tua doesn't know where to go with the ball because it's like, you know, he doesn't really have another read and then uh, he gets hit. And, you know, like last year, he gets really sadly concussed and the season's over. <laughs> but um, yeah. So I'm going to drag you into a cesspool that you probably know exists that I got dragged into by NBC Sports Boston uh, back in week two. And I know Dolphins fans are very sensitive about Tua. And this whole Tua and Mac, and as you just sort of described, when it's on script, yeah, Tua looks really good, and Tua's doing a really good job. When it's not on script, maybe he doesn't look as good, whereas Mac Jones, nothing's been on script for most of the year. But last week, it was like, oh, the script changed. He looks good. Where do you stand on sort of this, oh, if Mac was in Miami, he'd be making plays and looking like an accurate, good decision maker. This comparison of Alabama quarterbacks, one of whom is going to have probably a um, disappointing uh, loss on Sunday. Yeah. I I think they're, they are obviously much closer than their statistics, but like portray. Um, I do think Tua is currently a, a much better quarterback. Ooh, much better. what? Yeah. What the like Patriots that. have done to Mac Jones is, is, that is obvious. Like the level of consistency with which Tua plays, even in the context of his system, is at a much higher level than Mac Jones. And it's and it so you can't like it, it is a chicken and egg question, right? Because the system has created Tua into this great quarterback, and the Patriot system has sort of like deconstructed Mac uh, into sort of this inconsistent quarterback, and so. There, you can't really take one without the other, but I do think um, that Tua makes really good decisions in a way that, like, he has fewer dumb decisions. We see Mac just like, "What are you doing?" Right? Like, and those are the those are the windows where people who I I will admit, like, I am a defender of Mac Jones, like ninety five percent of the time, but those are the throws where you cannot defend him. And you're like, okay, well, you know, if you're going to be a game manager, manage the whole game. But if you're if you're going to be a game manager and you're going to make two terrible decisions per game, and we saw one against the Bills in the fourth quarter, who didn't make him pay for it. Remember, like they mm -hmm. they nearly intercepted the ball with like five minutes left or something, right? Yep. Yeah. And if they if they caught that, can you imagine what people would be saying about Mac Jones this week? That was a turnover worthy throw, even though it was dropped, right? So we still see those creeping into the game. That's where I think Mac is worse substantially than Tua right now. And it's it's partially due to supporting cast and and that being McDaniel. Mike McDaniel is, is one of the most important supporting cast members, what kind of right alongside Tyreek Hill. But if I was building an organization from from the ground zero and I was trying to decide between Tua and Mac, I would obviously pick Tua. Yeah, I think right now he kind of has uh, the popular vote as well. And I, and I agree with you that it could very well be a supporting cast issue as well, which is what is leading Mac to try to press and to do more as opposed to doing his job and staying in his lane. Uh, all right, so you said earlier that you think this is probably going to be around a 10-point game. The spread is 9.5, so it's kind of like right in, on par with what the experts um, and prognosticators are saying as well. 
Should Miami get the dub on Sunday and it plays out like you think it very well may, Henry, could you, uh, we always like to wrap on this one. Uh, given your familiarity with the Dolphins personnel, their health, and uh, what's going on right now in Miami Gardens, uh, on the post-game show Sunday, could you give us, if the Dolphins win, maybe one player on offense and one player on defense not named like Ramsey or Howard or Tyreek or Tua we may be talking about? Hmm. That's a good one. Um, let's see. Um, it's such a team of uh, big names. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's also they're so injured. Right. Let's go with um, on offense. Let me take. Um, I mean, we, yeah, it is, it's a start. It's a star. It's a star. Lady, they, team, have, I understand. They, they have their guys. Sorry, sorry to be yeah uh, not, to not have or just who you th- even even without having to be like a surprise name. Like who do you think will carry the day for them on each side of the ball is fine too. Okay, how about well, uh, is it Javon Holland? Does that qualify as one of those under the yeah, radar guys? Good, he's I mean yeah, yeah. he's like people know him, but I like Javon Holland a lot. Um, he actually hasn't had the best year, uh, he, but I think a part of that is the cornerbacks in front of him. Um, and so I think you see if you see suddenly the competence change at, at a much higher scale, you know, with the quality of play is better in front of him. He's he's operating Vic Fangio's defense. Vic Fangio comes in this offseason. He's like, you know, he's got this incredible reputation for for running high intelligence defenses. And Javon Holland is kind of the quarterback of that defense, sort of like Devin McCourty. But Javon is like younger. He's not really emerged yet, and it has not sort of come to fruition in the way that I think Miami thought it would, where he's really changing games. That could be a guy that we're talking about, you know, at the end of the game being like, wow, he this was his really big breakout moment in that Vic Fangio defense. Um, and then on on offense, you know, uh, like they have they have a set of, you know, third receivers. Like Braxton Berrios is a guy that New England kind of knows. He kind of beat them up a little bit in that in that week one matchup. Um, and then the running backs, you know, Jeff Wilson and Raheem Mostert. So, I mean, it's, I think because that offense has just become like a fantasy cash cow, everybody sort of knows who they are. And like I said, the offense isn't offensive line isn't going to surprise you necessarily. The tight end position, Durham Smythe. I don't think he's going to have a big game. I think that's why I was so stumped is kind of like the Dolphins do what they're going to do, right? Like, you you know, the names that are going to perform and they are sort of an inevitable in that sense. So I got I get to like cop out a little bit on that one, which is just like Tyreek is going to do less than you expect because Bill Belichick, that's how he play. He play game plans. Um, and so the, the Dolphins are going to have to ask like, Maybe River Craycraft. How about that name? I don't even know if yeah. he'll be active. He might not be active, but he's like in his practice window, I think, coming off IR. So maybe he'll play a little bit. Uh, and Plus, it sounds like a fake name. Yeah, yeah it really right. does. Exactly. It, it sounds like a Minecraft. <laughs> yeah, it sounds yeah. like a Minecraft mod. It doesn't sound like a human name. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It could like is Mostert so dinged up that it's it's a big Jeff Wilson game, and we're talking about oh man, we forgot about it. We slept on him, and he went off for a hundred and ten. Is this the Braxton Barrios? Is it is it finally time for Cedric Wilson to cash in on that three year, twenty one million dollar deal in year two, yeah. coming off the Cowboys to the Dolphins? Maybe he gets them. Uh, they just have so many options as well. You know, obviously far more than the Patriots. And you know, it's it. Vic Fangio was such a huge hire for them in the off season as well because that al- that allows Mike McDaniel to just focus on being you know the uh, dr- dry erase grease poured wonderkind as opposed to having to worry about the defensive side of the ball. So. Uh, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be a good game. I think we're probably in line for a much more entertaining Patriots Dolphins game. I think the nine and a half point spread probably will make lead some people to think it's going to be a blowout. I think obviously up this way, we're hoping the Patriots win, but if they can at least keep it close, it's got it's such a pivotal game, Andy. It, I mean, it's if pivotal. They, if they, I don't know if they'll keep it, it close. I'm kind of with Henry. I'll lay the points. <laughs> All right. Okay, I mean, I mean, Sorry. do they blow the team up afterwards, or can they get back on track? I mean, we're not going to start doing path math, as they like to say now. But anyway, Henry, we've taken up more time than we anticipated. Appreciate the chat and, and your insight as well across the entirety of the uh, 
AFC East, for all we know, the Jets will, you know, roll on Sunday and they'll be the AFC East champion. But the Dolphins do look good. We'll see where things go with the Pats. You can give Henry a follow at Henry C. McKenna. And, of course, read his musings, analysis, breakdown, scoops, and more at foxsports.com. Thanks for the chat, brother. Always good hanging. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Take it easy. Thanks, Henry. All right. Thank you very much. This has been Six Rings and Football Things, brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel, make every moment more. FanDuel.com slash Six Rings to take advantage of their awesome promos. We'll be back Sunday with a live Six Rings postgame show on WEEI. And until then, as always, good day, God bless, and go Pats.